all of the 652 of you, welcome to this happening where we will meet some of all the uh, innovations from Skåne saving the world. In Skåne we have a long tradition, a history of bringing world changing innovations to the market and we're also part of the Swedish innovation system and with me here to kick off this event I have my uh, partners in the innovation system and co-host of this event Joachim Nelson from Innovation Skåne and Ola Svedin uh, Mobile Heights. Joachim, Sweden is often uh, frequently actually ranked as second in the world when it comes to innovation. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I, I think it's a number of reasons actually. I think uh, I would like to pinpoint four. Uh, one is the innovation as such. We do have an innovation system that goes from like governmental down to regional down to local initiatives. And uh, we also have an innovation system that goes through research to ideas, to innovation, all the way to startups and to commercialization, uh, global commercialization. And that is in, in some sense unique and we all represent a part of that system. So that's, that's one, of course, a system that can support these companies uh, and innovation. Another thing is that quite many thing, uh, companies in, in uh, Sweden, I think, have to think global when they develop products, when they do develop services and so on, because the domestic market is very, very small. So you have that innovate, and when you think global, you also meet new innovation, you meet, you meet new type of initiatives. The third thing I would like to pinpoint is actually the great companies we have and the great research we have in, in Sweden. Uh, Quite many of them are global brands, and, and if you look at the number of global brands we have in Sweden per capita, it's extremely, extremely high. And, and there is also another point with these global brands. They have been able to, quite many, I come from the telecom industry, for instance. Uh, they have been able to adopt to standards or actually drive and set standards. And these standards have become global standards. And that is also a platform for innovation for small companies to jump into. And then a fourth thing I think is important is actually management and leadership style. I think we have, quite many companies at least, have in Sweden have a very flat structure. And also we, we stimulate people to take initiative and work with innovation. So quite many of the good innovations obviously come from the employees in the company. And that is, that is easy and that is, in a way, encouraged in, in this company. So those, those four, I think, are... Uh, I wouldn't say unique, but altogether, I think that it's a very good playground for, for innovation. True, yeah. true. And if we look at Skåne, the very south of Sweden, uh, what is so unique here, would you say, Ola? Well, first of all, we have more than 70,000 students here in Skåne alone. And if you look at the greater Copenhagen area, it's about 190,000 students. And that is, that is actually the largest talent recruiting pool in the Nordics when it comes to high-level expertise. That is one thing. The other thing is we have a really, really strong innovation support system here. With a very, very developed system with uh, cluster organizations, with uh, science parks, incubators, and other business support uh, systems. So if you take that uh, uh, and look at innovation, uh, uh, in particular we are strong in tech. Uh, and, and, and within tech we have AI, Cybersecurity, 5G, IoT, really, really strong areas, and we will see some examples of that today, I think. Um, uh, so if you, if you pool uh, uh, the, the, the great talent that we have here, the knowledge base that we have with this strong innovation engine, hmm. we are actually perfectly suited to bring sustainable solutions for the development of society, not only here in Skåne, but in the whole world. Yes, thank you. And as we have seen over the last couple of uh, months, it's increasingly important that we all come together to find the solutions to create a better tomorrow. A safer, healthier, greener and more resilient tomorrow. There is no time to rest. We all need to come together and work in different ways, uh, think out of the box, uh, work with cross-functional, diverse teams to find those solutions and to implement them faster than ever before. But most of all, we need to believe that it's possible. That if it has been done before, we can do it again. 
and you sitting there watching this, it could be your idea that makes all the difference next. So this day is to give hope, to inspire you to step up to the challenge, to join in, or just to be proud over all the Scorn innovations saving the world. And to guide us through the innovations today, I'd like to present our moderator. She is an uh, innovation specialist uh, at the UN organization, the UNOPS uh, Global Innovation Center, based here and one of our partners at the Idea on Science Park. Please welcome Rebecca Price. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Mia. Hi. Um, you will present yourself a little bit more, but can we just uh, hear from you? What are you most excited about today? but also to really hear how they plan to make a big impact on the world. That sounds good. And I leave the audience in your hands. Thank and you so much. We believe in you. Have a great day. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's event. My name is Rebecca Price. And before we kick off the event, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got here to Lund, Sweden. As Mia said, I am an innovation specialist at UN Ops here in Lund. But you can tell by my accent, I'm from the UK. I've been in Sweden for almost two years now exactly, which is amazing. But my background is in government. I was based in London working in the trade and business departments. I was doing a whole range of things, advising ministers, working in strategy teams, doing things around trade and aid programs. And I was working all the time and incredibly, incredibly stressed. And I stopped and I asked myself, am I doing something? Am I impacting the world in a way that I am proud of? And my answer was no. I had to make a really big decision. I quit my job. I moved my partner to learn Sweden. I started learning Swedish and getting involved in the local business ecosystem. And that's when I saw and felt this energy for innovation and new ideas. From the first respirator to the invention of Bluetooth, the innovations from this region have profoundly impacted the lives of many of us around the world. And I realized change was possible and I became determined to be part of it. We have a mission, you and I together, to make a difference in the world. And in this mission, we need innovation. How do we create innovation? We look around the ecosystem, we nurture the ecosystem, we support the ecosystem, and sometimes we take bold risks. And the innovations that we need, they need to be sustainable, kind to our planet, and they need to be based in the right values. The Sustainable Development Goals are a bold commitment to tackle some of the most challenging issues that we're facing in the world today. The 17 goals are connected, so success in one impacts the success of another. In short, this is our best opportunity to create a better future for the ge future generation. Today's event is to inspire, but also to celebrate people, organizations, and individuals that are making a difference, trying to achieve sustainable development goals and make the world a better place. So with that being said, I would like to kick off today's event by inviting our first speaker to the stage. So Alexander Montel, Digital Sales Manager, Sony Network Con Connections, Europe, Sony didn't invent the Internet of Things, but we are making it work for you. Across industries, our customers are already using Sony solutions to boost productivity and optimize 
end user experience. Easy to install, easy to use, easy to maintain. Our off-the-shelf solutions work immediately or can be tailor-made for you. With experience working with hundreds of millions of connected devices across the world, our goal remains unchanged. To empower people, business, and society to do things better in smarter ways. It's so great to have you with me today. How are you doing? I'm fine, Rebecca. Yeah, excited about today? Absolutely. Nice to be here. Yeah, great. So we just saw a pretty cool video, but how do you see your role in today's theme? Well, uh, I mean, for me personally, uh, one of the most important thing is actually doing what you're actually best at. Mm. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, one of the sustainability goals today is, is partnership, right? But doing what you're really, really good at and combining that with, uh, with others, uh, for me, that's, that's the ultimate thing for, for success. Uh, and at the company that I work, Sony Networks Communication, I mean, we are really born out of innovation. Uh, the services that we have uh, come up with, that I'll talk a little bit about today, they're actually founded from the employees at the, the, the Lund site here. Okay. So those type of innovations comes from uh, industry. Yeah. So we actually went out to the industry uh, f for years actually, uh, doing uh, a lot of research and incubation and, 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 and looked at different industries and, and what we can do and mm -hmm. what can innovate. And a couple of those ideas were actually taken into to what we are today yeah which is then uh, uh, connected services mm -hmm. uh, and IoT solutions, which okay. we then provide out uh, to the industry. Okay. Can uh, you give us any more specific examples? Yeah. Uh, so I'm here today to talk a little bit about healthcare. Okay. I mean, that's one of the industries that we have seen that, that really uh, has embraced the solutions. Of course, there's other industries, but healthcare is, is one of the industries mm -hmm. that we have seen. So. Uh, for example, uh, we have a, a solution, a tracking solution. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have one both for indoor and outdoor, but um, I'll, I'll try to be as concrete as <laughs> possible. So um, at hospitals today, yeah. uh, there's a lot of time just finding stuff. So stuff in my mind is assets. So that could be uh, hospital beds or it could be machines or whatever. So really what we do here is that we we, we put sensors on 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 the beds or machines, and we give the nurses uh, and other staff members at the hospitals the ability to find the stuff, know where they are, uh -huh. so that so that actually saves uh, a lot of time for mm -hmm. them at the actual hospitals. Another solution is is the outdoor tracking. A little bit the same thing here. We put a put a sensor on top of the asset, and we give them supply chain visibility for the person, so that can actually be a medical device that it, that costs a lot of money to ship you put the device on and you know exactly where there is in the supply chain but you also know that your package is safe that it that it's uh that's you know you can really follow it up all the way I in the supply chain um with two other solutions okay. also uh, uh another one is uh, for for nursing homes so in nursing homes today, we face uh, quite a lot of uh, difference with uh, uh, with drag cabinets, okay. and uh, here we're providing a service where uh, the staff at nursing homes could actually then, uh, with secure provisioning access, give access to who actually has the ability to open uh, the cabinets, and you can see, and you can then uh, provide. Uh, secure access to who who has access access to actual drug cabinets, and then and then the last real uh, really you know, innovation coming from us, which we are providing out today is is, is a remote monitoring system. Okay, and that's very I mean especially today's situation we have today is very discussed in healthcare, yeah, how you can actually uh, provide service at home. Mm. So how can you home monitoring? 
how can you actually give home care yeah. so that you can really turn this around what we have today with a lot of people coming into the hospitals being packed instead you can monitor and you can provide service out uh, uh, where they actually are when they're home sounds very relevant for everything happening today yeah it is and it's very exciting I yeah. mean, it's, uh, uh, and we're just in the beginning of the journey but as the previous speaker said here i mean we we have innovated this uh, and and with a global scale and now we're looking to, to to provide that out with industry leaders out to the market because you said that partnership is really important in the growth exactly i mean i would say the most important thing for us is, is doing our part what we're good at but also combining that with industry leader and what they're good at can i ask a question that some of us may be thinking today is there a possibility of having too much tech <laughs> i mean no I'll go a little bit philosophical, <laughs> okay. you, but, but uh, in my mind, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, of course, there is tech today that, that can, you know, what's the need of this? But I think in the long term, that would actually disappear. Uh, the, the important tech and the tech that actually moves us forward, that will, will continue and that will be so much important to, 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 to just achieve the different goals that we set up. And... I told you yesterday also a little bit about you know this lockdown that we had in yeah. in in the in the world today, mm -hmm. and you can see then how how the CO two has actually gone down. Yeah. But comparing that to the goals of of twenty thirty, you can actually see that we need to do so much more to actually improve. And then saying that we should stop tech or, or you know slow down tech, that's not possible. So, we need yeah. to accelerate and we need to do it better. Of course, in the gain of people and the, and the, the tech that is that is used, but uh, uh, for me personal, I I see that we need even even more technology. It's great to see how passionate you are about this this bigger theme as well. But how is the industry taking this healthcare? Yeah, I mean, uh, the first thing mm -hmm. they kind of say to to to, to us is or or me when I sp speak to, to customers. So so we. We are a business-to-business -business company, okay. so I've been contacted by you know companies. It's is Sony doing this? So that's the first yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Sony's famous for uh, for a lot of things, but but in this sector, we are kind of new. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is that mm, they say is that well, it's really nice to see that somebody has really listened to the industry and 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 gone into the industry and look at the, um, the different you know, challenges that they have. And this is really, really key for me that uh, providing services, doing technology or, or providing digital solutions has to gain. It has to be a gain for the people using it. Yeah. Otherwise, you're kind of losing the whole thing. And then on a bigger scale, if you have that gain for people, well, then you have the opportunity to actually make real change. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that is that coming back to that with a great network and see yourself in the ecosystem. You talked a lot about the ecosystem before, yeah. but I think that as a as a company and as a person, seeing yourself, where am I in the ecosystem? What can I contribute to? Not not just doing something. Something mm -hmm. is good. Mm -hmm. I mean, we start doing something, but doing something which together with other will be a, a greater effect. That is, that is, I believe, is the next step to achieve uh, also the, yeah, the SDG I'm, goals. I'm really excited to hear you say that. Okay, you're obviously a tech guy. I want to see <laughs> some of your tech. I saw your watch. It looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not that <laughs> big of a tech guy, actually, but, uh, but I am working for Sony now, yeah. so I, I, I'm becoming. Yeah, but yeah, for the, this, for example. So okay. this is... This is our home monitoring okay. watch. So here you can see actually the sensors uh, in here. Yep. And this is this is the device, of course, okay. but we have built the whole, whole solution around this. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's really unique about it is that this could actually be tailor-made. So mm -hmm. anybody who wants to do remote monitoring, who mm -hmm. wants to provide that service out uh, to customers, could actually, with this uh, tool, develop their own solution on top of it. So anywhere around the world? Anywhere around mm -hmm. the world, uh, but also for different industries. Okay. So healthcare, of course, but uh, and that's very, very important. Again, coming back to that, we do what we're good at. Yeah. We do the device, the connectivity, the backend, but the partner, they do what they're good at. Okay. So the, 
the leaders in in healthcare mm -hmm. which are good of you know clients patients or or they medical know. devices yeah. they could build on top of that so that's one of them uh, and the other one i i have with <laughs> me today <laughs> is is the tracker okay. that i told you about so really very simple okay put the tracker on whatever you would like to track mm -hmm. and then this one sends signal back so in the supply chain you put this on a machine or you put this on 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 a you know medicals or, yeah. or whatever and it, it gives send signal back uh, where it is yeah. but also it gives uh, a lot of information about shock detection mm -hmm. or uh, you know um, how how the goods are actually or the the, the yeah, the machine or uh, is actually doing it along the supply chain. So if anything's damaged or exactly, anything's happening. Exactly, exactly. So especially for high value goods, yeah. this is very, very. So really giving supply chain visibility, this this is what this uh, device do. So, so from so kind of big trucks to quite small instruments as well? Yeah, not, not so much about the trucks. It's more about the, 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 the things goods. in the yeah. truck. Okay. So that's what we're measuring here. Okay. And that's a big, big difference. So, uh, so yeah. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. It's been really interesting. And I really, yeah. I'm really inspired by the kind of the passion that you as an individual, as well as the organization show for the SDGs and this, this wider kind of aim that we're trying to kind of highlight and celebrate today. Yeah, but I, I, I think that's very important. You know, you see yeah. yourself in the picture, but also this with, with collaboration, networking and see yourself in the ecosystem. I think that is, uh, that is the way forward. And then of course, with a lot of good innovation and doing what you're best at. It's been my absolute pleasure to have you today. I would like to Thank now you, invite our next guest to the stage, Katrin Jung, Communications Manager, Cross Technology. Good morning. My name is Catherine Jung. I'm working for Cross Technology Solutions here in Lund. On the picture, you see me and my teammates. Looks pretty awesome, doesn't it? And today I will tell you how a smart software invention can change an entire industry, how our platform has impact on the entire ecosystem. But back to the picture. The tall guy in the middle <laughs> is Thomas. He's the CEO and founder of Cross Technology Solutions and the founder of Liveport. But the company is not him, the company is us. It's all of us. It's Jonathan, it's Philip, it's Andreas, it's us. And it's individuals putting their heart and soul in it. It's our unique skills, competences, motivation, because we truly believe what we do. We believe that we are able to change healthcare for the better for both patients and clinicians. And that's the story I want to tell you. And we are getting right to the next picture. I guess you're all familiar with this. You're seeing a waiting room and a scheduled time in a calendar. We all have a relation to healthcare. I mean, we are getting older. We are developing chronic diseases. We might have relatives who are suffering a disease and need support. So earlier or later, we will end up sitting in the waiting room. But do you know what? Non-acute healthcare is handled the same inefficient way as it was 100 years ago by booking a time in a calendar. And I ask you, is this the way we want to do it the next 100 years? Especially for those suffering chronic conditions are in the need to have like a continuous contact. And this brings us to Lifeport and the beginning of everything. You remember the tall guy in the middle of the picture, Thomas? It's his idea. And 15 years ago, he was working with diabetes patients and a lot of questions occurred to him. And he was thinking of why not changing healthcare from a calendar-based system to a needs-based system. Today, we have built everything around a calendar booking, but it should be your need. It's about what you are needing, but your doctor or nurse 
does not even know what you need. Either you are suffering a chronic condition. So he was working with diabetes patients and he was asking himself, why don't patients know more about their conditions and how food substances influence the body? What makes me feel fine? What makes me feel bad? So his motivation was giving them more power, more insight, more knowledge to take control over their life and health. And then he was thinking at the same time he wanted to transfer this knowledge patients have gained to healthcare providers. So they actually would know their patients, knowing whom to help first. And this was and still is the basic idea of LifePod. It's very simple but genius. And it's changing the interest industry from calendar-based to needs-based because suddenly it's about your needs, which is getting visible for your doctor or nurse. And suddenly it's a flip. Suddenly the doctor is calling you, telling, uh, I'm seeing you are developing problems. The trend shows we need to change something and not the other way around. As you understand, we are seeing ourselves as a part of a bigger change. And today we are talking innovation and paradigm shift. And innovation is about finding new ways, a new way of thinking. And this is what Thomas did. And we see it has enormous impact on the industry. And that's it's why such a little company from Lund suddenly gets such attention. And there's a distinction between digitalization and digitization. Digitalization is doing analogous things digital. Like imagine meeting your doctor through a video link, but it's, it's still kind of the same. It's still a meeting between a patient and doctor and you need to gather at the same time in front of a screen. But digitization is doing it in a completely new way. Care might not even be a meeting between a patient and a doctor. Care might be something else. Care might be a doctor going into an a interface on the computer, watching their patients, telling them we need to change something. It can be at different times and different places. And it opens up for really new possibilities, but it has impact. It changes. It gives patients more power and knowledge, but it also might change the role of clinicians, people working in the healthcare sector. They might get more kind of a coach. Um, it might be a more continuous contact, not an episodic contact. Um, we are gathering data, so there's a history if my doctor asked me, or I mean, I can't remember what I had for supper last night, how should I remember everything happening in my body the last weeks? But suddenly I have a data history, which is a more well-informed meeting. So this is what we are doing. You remember, Thomas, the idea to change healthcare from calendar-based to needs-based care. And this is our core. We are visualizing the need in very clear and simple triage colors, red, yellow, and green. And your doctor or nurse knows that every, any time, everywhere, how you are doing and can talk, contact you. At the same time, you report data via application. So your doctor never needs to search for information and knows you, although you are not meeting. I give you a very short glimpse of our solution. On the picture, on the top to the left, you see the medical overview in the very clear triage colors. And it is the way you think it is. On the top, really many red, yellow dots. These are the patients with problems. These are the patients with the greatest needs. You have to call them first. They need treatment now. In the traditional way, you wouldn't know it. How could you? if everything is based on a calendar booking. And the patients further down with really many green dots are patients who are having their chronic condition under control. I mean, are you suffering a chronic condition? You have it every day, every night, 365 days a year. So you would need continuous contact. 
it's not like episodic contact and you need to get control over your life. A very short wrap up, the flip from calendar-based to needs-based care has this enormous impact because it's changing care from episodic to continuous. The whole thing is getting digital, not analogous. Remote, very um, important right now these days. Y you can meet your doctor wherever you want to, whenever, asynchronous. You don't need to meet at the same time. You can do it at different times. And a change is very important. Healthcare from being reactive to proactive. Your doctor or nurse can act before something has happened. They see changes early and contact you. Not like it's now. You are calling when something has happened. And it's real-time insights and patient-centered. It's around your personal needs. This is what I wanted to tell you. And we have a powerful solution, but we don't have the only solution. So together, I really think we can achieve a change. Thank you. Really interesting presentation. And I would, I would, I'm really inspired by the fact that you really put the person at the center. But taking it back a little bit, you mentioned you were part of a bigger change. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Of course, this is what I just did. And Healthcare is actually one of the last huge areas in society which has not gone through a digital transformation yet. We are just in the beginning. But the digital transformation is not just throwing technology in the healthcare sector. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it needs to change at so many places. It's workflows. It's more empowerment for patients. Mm -hmm. um, it really has impact on the entire ecosystem. And is, is this technology already in the system? Can people buy it? Yes, but I just uh, want to continue. It's about it's also about well-being okay. and empowerment and equality. Okay. Because it's about your needs. Yeah, like you said, might need something else than I do. Mm -hmm. And then it's getting visible. Yes, it, it's in use here in the region okay. for different health conditions. It's about congestive heart failure, okay. it's COPD, uh, infarction and kidney failure. But the power of the platform is that you can adjust it and scale it for kind of any kind of population you want to monitor remotely. Mm -hmm. And it's a med tech solution. So it's very high regulated and uh, requirements we have to fulfill for the patient's safety. Re I could ask you about this all day, <laughs> but thank you so much. I really appreciate your time in coming today. It was a pleasure. <laughs> I would like to invite our next speaker to this stage, Slakto Rita, CEO of Salavision. an audience in front of me always start uh, to ask the first question from my perspective uh, and, and since we're operating within blood and it's a bloody business uh, the first question is usually how many of the audience and you can answer this to yourself out there how many of you have ever taken a blood sample and, and probably the answer is everybody so I get a lot of hands up there so then the next question is uh, how many of you know what happens to the blood sample once you're given it in gone to lab and, and provided it and usually that's like nobody so uh, it's interesting that people have more clue about uh, the latest car or the latest iPhone uh, configuration than what happens with, with a blood sample, which is, I think, very important for your, for your health. And, and of course, Cellavision, we focus on trying to improve blood analysis uh, worldwide. Uh, we kind of deliver what I would say the holy grail uh, within healthcare. The holy grail is that you can improve outcome, in our case, diagnostics and at the same time that you can save costs for, for the healthcare. And of course you have to prove that as well. And, and the issue we have basically is that we, we try to replace something that's been in, in the labs for let's say 100 years, traditional microscopes and, and metex that are analyzing in those. And, 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 and of course uh, we're a little bit like uh, you have a mechanical typewriter and it's been there for many, many years and then you come with a fully loaded PC with internet. 
and you have to explain to the customers that the fully loaded PC with internet is slightly better than a mechanical typewriter. And in our industry, that's not always that easy. So we have a very simple vision. We're there to replace all microscopes or traditional microscopes in labs with our technology, basically. And Vision technology was founded and based here and innovated here in Lund. Uh, so basically the market where we operate, and I think especially in healthcare, we're a niche company, but in that niche we would like to be best. Uh, and in healthcare it's all about the workflow. Usually you're part of a system. And, and where we focus our efforts in on what we call the large labs. So there are roughly 4 billion blood samples taken every year globally. And those are analyzed in, 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 in different ways. But you try to kind of find out, I would say, three complications basically. Either it's some kind of blood cancer related disease, or it's some kind of anemia. Uh, blood cancer could be lymphoma, myeloma, that type of, uh, or leukemia. It uh, could be anemia, and it could also be some kind of severe infection. So, so there are roughly 30 of those uh, diseases or complications that you would like to diagnose. And it's extremely important because the right diagnosis means that you can also start the right treatment. And our focus is, of course, to as fast as possible to, to make sure that there, there is the right diagnosis. So 4 billion samples, you go to a lab, you provide your blood. Uh, the lab will test that in two stages or steps. The first step is what you call a cell counter technology. So they will check the blood whether it's normal or something is abnormal. And, and that's not our part. Our part comes in a step two. So that if there is something abnormal with the blood, so that's the, the first step will react and say, you have to take a second analysis, uh, second step in this analysis, then we come in. And that roughly happens to 15% of all these 4 billion samples. So the, the, the kind of the market we have annually is around 600 million blood samples that needs to be analyzed. And those can be analyzed in two ways. Either you do it the traditional way, uh, you look at it uh, <coughs> uh, uh, with a medtech, and then you count white and red blood cells and see the distribution of those. And that basically founds the, the, the base for the diagnosis. The other alternative is cellivision. So basically what we do with our technology is that we replace the hands, the eyes, and the brain of, of a, of a, of a medtech in the lab. And, and the hands, that's kind of a precise robotics basically. So we have a robot in our system that takes the slide and puts it under a microscope. And then we have a digital camera that takes a picture. And then finally we have using AI basically to, to classify and recognize white and red blood cells. And there are 17 white and 25, 21 different red blood cells that needs to be categorized and classified. So we give that kind of as a, as a support for the, for the pathologist or the medtech, and then you can, at the end of the day, hopefully take the right, uh, have the right diagnosis. There are 17,000 labs worldwide, or large labs. Uh, a large lab for us is a lab that has more than 130 samples per day. A typical large lab would be uh, Lund or Malmö here. And, and we have managed during the last 15 years to go from nothing to 21% globally. So we have more than 3,500 labs globally using Cellavision today, all over the world, basically. Uh, and, 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 and we are unique in that sense that we don't have our competitor is still the traditional microscopes. So as you can see here in the, in the slide, we still unfortunately have 80% almost to, to replace. So we have a long way to go in this traditional, uh, in this traditional <coughs> business, I would say. Uh, then there is another segment, which is a new segment where we just entered with an innovation that was basically done in this building where I'm standing here up on the fourth floor. Uh, and there are also 100,000 small labs out there. Uh, a small lab cannot afford uh, the same kind of system as, as a large lab because uh, basically it's a lower throughput. And, and typical small labs in this region would be Eustad or Trelleborg as two examples. And, and, and that's labs that have less than 130 samples per day, basically. And, and what we're trying to do now is that we just launched a new product called DC1, which is basically the same software and, and artificial intelligence uh, analysis. You get the same analysis, but with a lower throughput and thereby a lower cost for the customers. But then you can, of course, start to connect the labs. You can connect, uh, if you take Skeone, for example, we have Krihuansta, Helsingborg, Malm and Lund that already have the large systems that I showed in the previous slide. And then you can combine the other 10 to 14 uh, small labs like Eustat Trelleboy in, in the same network, basically, and thereby step by step replacing old traditional microscopy. And of course, to be able to do that, you have to have as good analysis as, as any human being. So, so that's, that's, of course, very important. So what Cellavision has done step by step throughout the years is basically to step by step add, add components to the offering. Uh, you see the full workflow in a lab here with the first step and then 
we come in as of the slide smearing uh, uh, stage. Then you have stains, you have a stainer, stain protocols, which are very important, and then you have the digital morphology, which is our microscope. And, and 10 years ago, or only five years ago, or I would say only three years ago even, we only had an offering up in the upper right corner. And then we step by step built our portfolio with own development, but also through acquisitions to really, I would say, create the future optimal world-class analysis uh, opportunities. And I think from a technology perspe perspective, since we're talking about innovation today, I think we're mixing free or bringing together three different technology to really make, make this outstanding. And outstanding means that it's better than the human being can do. It's staining, which is basically that you have prepared to prepare the, the glass uh, that, that, that you look at in the microscope. Uh, with the right, I would say, coloring, basically, so that you get sharp pictures. That's extremely important. And we now have a, a division within Cellavision that uh, provides reagents, basically. Combining that with optics and precision mechanics so that you really place that glass or slide perfectly under a camera so that you can take a really, really sharp picture that looks as good as if you look at it in a microscope is extremely important. And then the third step, basically, is that you have a lot of stuff, <laughs> blood, blood, blood components uh, on a slide. And you have, of course, to understand what is what here, because that founds uh, the, the base for, for diagnosis. So then we have software and also, these days, more and more deep learning algorithms that we use. So we have gathered a lot of slides worldwide uh, to really make sure that we can cover all markets and, and trained our networks or trained our systems that they, so they can recognize different types of red and white blood cells, basically all these 17, respectively 21 that I talked about. So basically, if you combine those three technologies that we are trying to do here every day, you improve the image quality, which is extremely important, I think, in everything you do. In, in, we are focused on blood, but whatever type of image analysis you do these days, and you know that's a very hot topic and, and hyped area, it's extremely important that you have very sharp uh, image analysis. In our world, that means that if you have a sharp image, you can do self-classification correctly. Uh, and that's, of course, a very important thing in a, in a very regulatory, uh, regulatory market that we operate within, is that we can prove that our camera takes as good pictures and sharp pictures of the cells as any human being can do in a microscope. And then the other very important thing in healthcare is that you address the lab workflow. You have to make that more efficient, extremely important. And, 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 and that's where you save the money. So basically, our system, once it's installed in a lab, replaces two persons, basically. So the payoff for the customer is, uh, is I would say, uh, less than a year normally. But they have to do the upfront investment, of course. Uh, and that makes it quite attractive. And that's also one of the, the reasons why we managed to penetrate from scratch, basically, because we are a disruptive technology. So we had to do all the work ourselves, from nothing to yeah, more than 3,500 labs end of last year that operates in our system. And we still don't have one single lab that's gone back to the mechanical typewriter, so to speak, once they've been used to our technology. So that means that once we get into a lab, uh, even if it's sometimes seen as a black box new technology and they don't fully understand what they get, uh, once we're in there, they, 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 they stay with us because you don't go, you don't go back to, to, to the mechanical typewriter basically once you get used or a traditional microscope in our case. I think another very important aspect, which is my, 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 my final here, is uh, to sum it up a little bit, is also that it's one thing to have the technology. Uh, a lot of companies, especially here, I think, in, 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 in Lund, uh, there are fantastic companies that have amazing technology. The problem for many companies is that they don't have a strong view on how to take that technology to the customer and how to explain the benefits and value proposition to the customer. And, and in Cellavision, we spend as much time almost to, as to develop the technology as to how to get it to the lab uh, and make sure that you, 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 you work in a very optimal way to do that. And I think that's been part of our success. So just to understand how we've taken it, we, we know that we had a fantastic technology here in Lund and we want to place that technology in 117,000 labs worldwide, basically. That's our end game, at least. The 17,000 large labs and uh, 100,000 small labs. And, and that also means that you have to have the right business model. So we chose to go with big partners. We are part, we're like Intel Inside, you could say, or, or similar, where we place our technology together with the large uh, hematology providers, companies like Siemens or Abbott, or uh, there is a big Japanese company called Sysmex. But we also, also in, installed uh, or, or established our presence in many markets, because when you come with a new technology, you have to explain that to customers, because otherwise you don't sell anything. So during the last five years, we basically expanded and we have now presence with Cellavision employees in almost 20, country covering 20 countries worldwide. 
in, it's all from Australia, China, Korea, we have Europe, we have South America and North America. So basically the largest 20 countries in the world we have presence today, where we have local television people speaking the local language and trying to translate our technology or persuade or, or create awareness around our technology, hook up with key opinion leaders and step by step make sure that the first you know, reference center buys it and then, then, you, then you establish your presence. And for that approach, we managed to become uh, the golden standard in some markets today. In US, Canada, I would say Sweden, Denmark, uh, France, Benelux, every customer that goes and, and replaces their hematology line uh, where they do the blood analysis would go sell a vision. So there are five to 10 markets today where, where we have 100% you say attachment rate. So, and I think that's great, but we still have 195 countries to conquer in different ways where we have a lower uh, penetration. So that's a little bit about us, and um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Thank Very uh, knowledgeable person. I have a question for you. How will artificial intelligence help us achieve the sustainable development goals? I think, I think when you combine AI with, with digitalization, I mean, you, you have effects all over the place. Uh, in our role, for example, because that's where I have my reference, mm -hmm. is that you, you have less transportation. Today, if you do a traditional microscopy, you have a patient in Eustad, for example, mm -hmm. down here in southern Sweden, and, and you want to have a, and you have a suspicion of some kind of critical disease, that slide normally has to be transported to a larger lab by car or whatever. Sure. Uh, if you place our system, then you have a database. So you scan it there, and then anybody anywhere can look at it. So, so, so you have this kind of effects. You have shorter turnaround times, mm -hmm. but also you reduce transportation. And, and of course, our personnel or the lab personnel can also sit at home, for example, and do right. the analysis, so they don't have to travel. So I think when AI comes in and combined with you know, digitalization is that you will see that uh, the remote access, remote work, all those things that sometimes drives uh, transportation mm -hmm. uh, will, will, will decrease, basically. And I think AI is coming kind of all over. It, 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 it makes the, the, the world more used in the right way. It makes yeah. a lot of things mo much more efficient. So there's huge potential. I think it is. And, and it's coming now everywhere, basically, even in, in a traditional uh, business like ours. Yeah. Talking of huge potential, I heard earlier you were interested in meeting one of our up-and-coming entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. Yeah. Should we I'm bring him on curious. stage? We should do that. Yeah, absolutely. I would like to invite Jonathan to the stage to perhaps join us here. One of humanity's biggest threats is the ever-growing water shortage. Today, more than 2 billion people lack access to clean water. And one of the reasons behind this water shortage is that industries consume 20% of all the fresh water in the world. And unfortunately, the global demand for industrial water is estimated to double by 2040. At the same time, it's calculated that 50% of all the world's energy is lost due to waste heat. So what if these industries could use their waste heat to become self-sustaining in the water use? My name is Jonathan Persson, and I'm the founder of Helios Innovation. When I was 16 years old, I developed a new desalination method that can use waste heat from heavy industries to clean salt water. The method works by letting hot salt water flow through specially designed cellulose structure, which exposes huge amounts of water surface. Behind the block, there's a huge fan that blows air through it, and when the air gets in contact with this hot water surface, around 5 to 10% of the water instantly evaporates and comes out as a steam. This steam is then cooled down on cold seawater pipes, where we can collect a distilled water that factories can use instead of buying tap water. With this method, we can clean the salt water up to 30 times cheaper than European tap water create an eco-friendly brine that doesn't affect the marine life, and reduce the production cost by up to 80% compared to conventional desalination plants. We are now building a full-scale pilot facility that will be able to clean 50,000 liters every day, and is ready to be tested this summer. After this, we, we will build 10 fully functional desalination units and aim to introduce them to the market by 2021. We are currently looking for partners, so if you are a factory that wants to lower your water consumption or a municipality that struggles with water shortage, please feel free to contact me or visit heliusinnovation.se. Because my dream is that Helios Innovation will be a driving force in creating a climate resilient society. 
We hope to rapidly introduce our technology within the heavy industries and make them self-sustaining and thereby saving water for millions of people all around the world. Thank you. Amazing. I mean, I got shivers. <laughs> Thank you. Come and join us on the couch here. Thank you. So, so I have a question for you. Um, I think it's very interesting and it's very uh, encouraging to see this uh, young people coming out with innovations and try to, but what would you say is the major kind of entry barrier for you worldwide? What would be kind of the, the thing that you have to think about to get out with this technology globally? We have two main problems, is that the industry is quite conservative. They don't want to try new technology until they have seen someone else use it. So it's the entry stage that is the hardest. And the other problem is that water is so cheap. It isn't valued as much because either we have too much of it or it's subsidized by states and municipalities. So we have to make the factories understand that the water has a, v a value for the society uh, and thereby want encourage them to do the great uh, work for the greater good for the society. And you mentioned in your presentation that you were 16 years old when you came up with this idea. I mean, that's inspirational. Where did this come from? As most teenager, I was <laughs> lying at my cu uh, couch, but I was watching a documentary about okay. how they built greenhouses in a desert environment. Okay. It's a project called Sahara Forest Project. Mm -hmm. And they used these cellular structure to cool down and moisturize the crops. Okay. And when I saw this moisturize for the crops, I got like a eureka moment and thought, hey, what happened if you only focus about the moist? You try to create as much steam as possible. And I worked for a few months, and after that I had a brand new uh, desalination technology. Wow, I mean, <laughs> it's incredible. And you are the future generation that I was talking about earlier. Like, what is your role in this? I think everyone has a role in mm -hmm. creating a, greater, uh, a better world. And many think that you have to have a PhD and becoming an engineer before you can do something. Yeah. but that's completely false because everyone has great ideas uh, and even youth. So I am really engaged in uh, youth and entrepreneur uh, okay. and entrepreneurial questions and try to make as many young people as possible take that step to be able to be brave enough to create their own company and try to realize their ideas. That's amazing. So anyone watching today <laughs> has the potential to create their ideas. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you. Thank you. <laughs> I would like to welcome our next speaker. They're unfortunately unable to join us in the room. Bjorn Jonsson, Professor Emeritus at Clinical Physiology at Lund University. Bjorn is 80 years old and he has an incredible story. Um, and so we went to his home, Lotta Westfield, Relationship Manager at Dion Science Park, went to his garden and interviewed him. It's an incredibly inspiring story. I offer this video, it's 17 minutes long, and I'll see you at the other end. Thank you so much. Since many years, since decades, I've been working on the problems of mechanical ventilation in people with very severe lung disease, particularly ARDS, and that's what the COVID-19 patients are dying from. And uh, I have been developing a concept based on physics and physiology and a little bit of mathematics in order to define how these patients should be ventilated and also how one should monitor the physiological function of these patients so that you can really know how to ventilate them optimally. And uh, I have been working in this field for 50 years and uh, I was on my way to publish a, a rather large essay with all my conclusions in this field. But then came the pandemic, the pandemic. 
and I realized that it would not influence the society because all these people will be working so hard so they will have very difficult, great difficulties to take up new ideas, partly new concepts. So I thought, what can I do in this situation, in this extremely dangerous and severe situation? And I thought about the ventilators. And there are two kinds of ventilators around. One type is intensive care ventilators, which are extremely sophisticated. You can do a lot of things with them. They have all screens, and the screens are crumbled with numbers and curves. They're good for people who really know how to use them. Then there is the other sort of ventilators, which are simple ventilators, often non-invasive, which you apply a mask or uh, nasal prongs, also to connect to the airways. And these simple ventilators, they can help people giving some comfort. But they are not suitable for the very severe cases of ARDS in corona patients. So I thought, wouldn't it be possible to develop a ventilator which is doing all the things the proper things to treat these patients. Not every patient, but specifically the COVID-19 patients with very severe respiratory distress. And in the same time, be very simple. They should have a screen, but the screen should only show the absolute essential information in terms of some simple curves and a few numbers. They should be very simple to set the ventilator. Few parameters to set should be strictly logical. So a ventilator which is as all the capacity needed, but still is very simple to use, fast to learn for people who have not long training and developed a high expertise in ventilation. I thought that would be possible and I must try. And that's what I'm doing now. But all those ventilators and respirators that we see in the market now, that countries buy ten thousands of, are they completely useless? I, I, these simple ventilators which are being developed now and uh, politicians and industrialists they say that we can produce them in tens of thousands they can provide some comfort to the patient who is fighting for his life they can also bring comfort to the personnel the doctors and nurses because they can do something and the politicians, they can say, well, see what we have done. Tens of thousands of ventilators are distributed. I have done my job. However, these ventilators are not fit to save the lives of the patients. Bring some comfort, and that's about it. You need to save these patients. The patients must be intubated, have a full narcosis, sedation and narcosis, maybe muscle relaxation also, so that the ventilator can completely take over ventilation. Because otherwise the lung is getting more and more damaged by ventilation itself. Ventilation by the patient or by uh, an improper ventilator. That will rip the lungs apart mm. in different ways. And I know exactly which ways the lungs are being ripped apart. And so my ventilator should avoid this, still be as simple as the low-grade ventilators to use and to learn. You have a long life experience in ventilators. 
Yes, it started in about 1965. Uh, I was working together with an associate professor Sven Ingelstedt at the ENT department in developing means to study lungs, to study physiology of lungs. He had a pamphlet on his, in his bookshelf and on the back it said God and I know. And so I said to Sven, well God and you, couldn't we be three? Well, as time goes by, it's as time goes by, said Sven. It was not much more than a week later, I found this pamphlet on my desk and I read and nearly everything stayed between God and Sven because I didn't understand exactly what he meant. But on one page he said, ventilators are flow or pressure controlled or volume controlled. That is silly. They should be flow controlled. Why? Well, then you could do anything you want. P.S. Postscriptum. You can't control flow. But I was taken in by this idea and I said to Sven, but if I develop a flow controller, couldn't we make a ventilator along these ideas? Well, yes, yes, of course you can. Started to cons construct flow controllers. But I had to learn. I had to learn how to use a mill and a lathe. And I found a, a wonderful person at the mechanical workshop at the hospital, Leonard Holst. And he gave me his, an hour or two showing how these machines worked. I was even allowed to use them on, uh, in, the, in the weekends when the workshop was empty. And I was, I also needed to work on glass because the flow controller had parts of glass inside. And I met another great man, Alf Lundberg, at the Chemie Centrum, chemical center of Lund. He was a glass blower. And he also offered me some knowledge about how to, not to blow glass, but to cut and mill and uh, uh, drill in glass. One day, on Saturday, I was in the mechanical workshop using the mill and I was polishing a, gl a plexiglass cylinder at very high speed. And then I stopped the mill and the shuck, we call it, the rotating tool holder, the workpiece holder. And it continued to rotate and it got loose. And it weighs about six, seven kilos, and it danced all around the room, and I took shelter behind the lathe. I was thrown out of the workshop, of course. I found a solution how to have a very good flow controller. Mechanical one, no electronics. And I started to build a, a ventilator. I found an engineer. There were no hospital engineers in these days. But there was a man who was selling ECG machines and uh, bicycles, exercise bicycles, ergometers, uh, to the Department of Clinic, Clinical Physiology where I was working. And uh, I said, you must create some electronics to open and close my flow regulators to start and stop inspirations and expirations. And so he did. And within a very short period of time we had a small ventilator, about three and a half kilo, 
that could do everything an Engström ventilator in these days could do, and much, much more. It could, for example, follow the breath, to some extent, follow the breaths of the patient. In 1970, the first prototype of Servo Ventilator 900 was operative and used in animal experiments. In 1971, after just three years, we had the Servo Ventilator on the Scandinavian market to start with. It created a revolution. It was small, about 10 kilos. The Engström ventilator weighed about 180 kilos. The server ventilator was silent. And that was a little bit of a problem because the staff was used to, to that the ventilator should say, whoosh, 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 and they stood there and ventilated the patient without a sound. Without, they couldn't see a, move, a movement. <laughs> so they thought they were a little bit afraid that it didn't work. But it worked, of course. It not only ventilated the patient, I was a physiologist, I was a clinical physiologist. So it was a monitoring machine. So it followed the pressure, it measured pressure, it measured flow rate, it transformed flow rate to volumes, to tidal volumes, to minute ventilation. And these could be monitored, the pressures and the ventilation, and alarms were issued when something wasn't correct. That was another problem, because the staff were not used to alarms. So something like beep, beep, beep. They were disturbed to start with, and we, we had to really go through training, say that this is good for you, that you can relax, and as long as it doesn't say beep, 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 it's, everything is okay. These were the days in 1971. Many open doors, it sounds like. More easy access. Yeah. As you have expressed. It was a, it was a, we worked under complete freedom. Adequate economic resources could pick our people, very young people. Most of these people came directly from uh, the technical high school in Stockholm or, or other states, places. And, uh, We, we trained them in the medical field and in the physiology, physiological field, expressed what we needed, and they solved the problems. It was a miraculous time, and it created a, mac a, a miracle. The serve ventilator was a miracle in these days. I, uh, proud to say that. I have never said these words before, but <laughs> now I dare to do it. Well, I've been working for the last about six, seven weeks with a big Swedish company with a conceptual development. And we are ready with the concept. And we have shown that it is possible to build such a ventilator. It is possible to build it at a price which is much, much lower than the price for intensive care ventilators in general. But this company, they are not selling. It's, they have no sales organization. So, we are a little bit stuck at the moment because we need people who are ready to invest. And we have to identify companies who are willing to accept the risk to put this on the market because it's a difficult market and there are risks involved. Even if this ventilator would be very good, very efficient. There are large obstacles. Regulations, for example. 
you must have these accepted by authorities. And for COVID-19, you could probably solve the last for a temporary allowance to sell it. But you need something more to, for the investors. So what is needed is, what I say, true industrialists, like the people I met in 1967, who are saying, we take the risk, here you have the resources, and if you are successful, we will sell it and bring it to the market. I have said, it's, my trip was pretty easy. I was lucky. I met the wonderful people, the right people. I got the idea from Sven. And then I started it all. Today it's more difficult. But believe me, it will always be possible. There are these wonderful people around. You must find them. You have an idea, you must, n nothing should stop you. Work on your ideas, make them clear, find the proper people, show them, catch them, and do it. Thank you for sharing your story with us. And talking about wonderful people, the next guest is a wonderful person. And if you've been watching the news recently, you would have heard about this company, Alon Road. I would like to introduce Karen Ebbinghaus, CEO, Alon Road. Four point two million people die from air pollution. Our cities around the world are heavily polluted by transportation. This needs to change. I'm Karen Ebbinghaus, I'm the CEO of Elon Road, and we wanted to make change happen. We are now facing challenging times. We are all affected by the pandemic and COVID-19, but hopefully we can find solutions and cures within short. But we are all facing challenging times in form of the climate crisis. And we cannot lose focus on finding innovations and solutions that enable us to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement. In Sweden, where we are situated, the road transportation stands for almost a third of our CO2 emissions. But the Swedish government has made ambitious targets to reduce those with 70% by 2030 in order to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. In order to do so, we need to remove our dependency upon fossil fuel vehicles. Electrification is one solution, especially here in Sweden, where we have access to a lot of renewable energy. But not all kinds of vehicles are suited to be electrified or to carry around heavy and large batteries. Take example, a heavy truck. It would probably need six to eight tons of batteries to be able to run a whole day. That is not environmentally or profitable. There is a need for another solution. And think about it. Why should we carry around all the power we need to drive a, a car or a vehicle? We don't do that with trains. Trains are rarely run by batteries. And if you look around in our households, we don't have our kitchen appliances run by batteries because we have found other solutions. This could also apply for the transportation sector. For our personal cars, batteries, of course, is one solution, as we normally just drive them during the day and we can charge them overnight. But for commercial vehicles or heavy transportation, that is not a solution. So we have come up with something more different. Wouldn't it be more sense if you could charge them while you were driving? We're a startup from Lund who have a created solution to enable unlimited reach with very small batteries. It's a dynamic charging solution, which means you can charge both while you are driving as when you're being parked. 
It's a conductive charging solution, meaning that you have a rail on the road and a pickup mounted on the vehicle. The pickup is in contact with the road to enable power distribution. An encrypted radio signal is distributed uh, from the vehicle and accepted by the road, who will then unlock the road and give power in very short segments of one meter at a time. The short power segment is unique for our solution and is the one that enables us to give you charging both while you are driving as well as when you park. And when you do park, you can just drive over the rail, turn off the key, and you don't have to do anything. The parking will charge start automatically. That's it. Electrical roads can be used for many different applications. It's a very inclusive infrastructure. It can power large heavy vehicles used for ports or mines, which is quite otherwise difficult to electrify because they are need high effect and they are in high operation. But it can also be used for passenger cars. If there were electrical roads in place, cars would use so small batteries that they would be very cheap to buy, thus enabling more people to afford to buy EVs. And the electrification can be quicker but it's also very good for public transportation. Take the example here in Lund. We have 10 bus lines. So if you want to electrify those 10 bus lines, what different solutions do you have? Well, one solution would be end station charging, but then you would need 20 end station chargers at the cost of approximately 80 million Swedish kroners. But we have calculated, together with the team at the university, that for those 10 bus lines, you only need 6.7 kilometers of electrical road in the city, because the buses share the same route every now and then. And together with the equipment you need on board the vehicle, uh, we would face approximately the same cost. Whereas in the case of the end station chargers, it's only the buses that can use that. But if you have an electrical road, all different kinds of vehicles can use and share the same infrastructure. So the city can be smart and uh, environmental friendly. Taxis, commercial vehicles and other can also use the infrastructure. I think that's quite smart. The, our road can distribute 300 kilowatts, uh, which is quite high, but it is required to uh, enable large and heavy uh, trucks both to drive and charge the batteries. And this means when a, a truck is driving on our road, it will use the road to drive, but also charge its batteries. So when it drives off the road, it can use the batteries as an extension. Uh, provider. But means also that we don't need electrical roads everywhere. It's only for the really heavy trafficked part. The road has also built in high technology, such as sensors and wireless communication. This will enable us to provide access control, billing solution, and accident monitoring. We will have different sensors uh, like temperature and radar. So the road will really know when there's a temperature drop a bit further ahead. So it can, warm the, uh, it can warn the driver, oh, you will have to drive carefully because it's a uh, freeze. Uh, or if there's an animal on the road. You know, here in Sweden, we have a lot of elks running around everywhere. So the road will be able to tell the driver, be careful, drive slow. So not only do we provide charging on the go, we also make the roads smart. There are other similar solutions, other conductive charging overhead lines, but our solution is the most cost efficient and easy to install. For city environment, you only glue the rail to the asphalt. No need to reconstruct, and if you have to do some repair work, it's easy and flexible to move. And it's totally safe. As I said before, the power is only distributed in one meter segments and unlocked by an encrypted code. So other passengers and drivers can move freely and safe. But there's a catch, of course. There's always a catch. Electrical roads are economically and environmentally better than most other charging solutions. But who should pay for them? Before they are used by many and the cost can be shared by many. 
And having smaller batteries, which is the real environmental and societal benefit. Well, normally, the climate is not a stakeholder when you do a return on investment calculation. It should. And hopefully, we will have brave and innovative politicians and business people who do include the climate in its calculation and act upon it. As a company, we are also on an exciting journey. Dan Citrius, who is our founder, he, is, he came from a background um, from film and television, but has always had a very creative mind. And he wanted to buy an electrical car, but he thought it was too expensive and the batteries didn't provide sufficient, sufficient range. And as he was uh, driving to work one day, he noted uh, a bit of snow slush in the middle of the road. Yes, we do have things like that here in the southern part of Sweden every now and then. And it was luckily because that image gave him ideas. What if I placed something in the middle of the road that could charge my vehicles? Because he was thinking of his childhood car tracks. So he went home, uh, thought about it, discussed it with some friends, and then started to build a prototype in Lego at his kitchen table, as you can see here. And he teamed up uh, with a professor at Lund University, Mats Allakulla, and together with different scientists, they developed the technology that we now can find in a large-scale demo project here in Lund. Uh, also known as the Evolution Road, a project which we just built this week, together with our consortium members, uh, which we are nine, so we haven't done it alone, and we're very grateful for all the help we have gotten along the road. Unlimited range with small batteries is not science fiction or something that can happen in the future. It happens now. It works today. Sweden has ambitious targets to reduce its CO2 emissions by 2030. So it has a pipeline of different electrical road projects. Next in line is a 30 kilometer stretch, but the big cities are also in pipeline. And if you take the stretch between Malmö, Stockholm, Ball, Stockholm, Gothenburg and back, it's a triangle, it's approximately 1600 kilometers. And if you would electrify that, it's a property uh, cost of 20 to 30 billion Swedish kroner, which is only a fraction compared to high speed trains. Trains are of course an excellent way of traveling, but it will not solve the issues of CO2 emissions in road transportation alone. We need alternative solutions. Our technology and solution is something that is preparing us for the future. Today, we own our cars, we drive them during the day and we park and charge them overnight. But in the future, when we have autonomous vehicles using our road to see around the corner, we will not need to own our car. The same unit as uh, will drive us uh, during the day will drive parcels and goods during night. We need to rethink how transportation is used, designed and performed. We cannot copy the infrastructure that we have used for the gasoline car into our future need. We need to change our perspective of today in order to what we need for tomorrow. Due to the lockdown, the skies of Milano, one of Europe's most polluted cities, are now blue. Reducing or restricting transportation will not be beneficial for the global economy. We still need to move. An electrical road can enable us to keep on moving, but without negatively affecting the climate. Electrical roads are ready to be implemented now. It's a, a technology which will enable us to reduce our emissions with one third. And that is why I call it a save the world technology. We're on a mission, so join us on a journey to a more sustainable future. Great. That's really <laughs> inspiring. And I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about how you think electrical roads could help us tackle climate change. Well, I think that we are sort of still in, in the perception of our traditions. And, and did you know that when we first designed roads, we had the same wide when, uh, bread yeah. as 
two horses. Okay. Yeah. So we sort of every time we make a leap of technology, we sort of bring the old technology with us. So we just need to scramble away that mm -hmm. and need to design a more holistic perspective of what w what the future of transportation would look like. And I, I loved your reference to mooses. I yeah. uh, spent my summer last year traveling around Sweden, so it's great that we can <laughs> engage yeah. with nature yes. and be kind to nature, yeah. right? I think that's really important. So what does the future of transportation look like to you? Well, I think that we will not own our own vehicles in the future. Okay. I think it will be, not only do we need to electrify and have, so lower our emissions, we just don't need so much transportation, so we make, have to make it much more effective. I, I think that's really interesting mm. to think about. Um, so you guys have lots going on. You're you're in the news. What's what's coming up for you? Yes. So next week, th glad you. Asked. <laughs> <laughs> next week we're having our big opening ceremony on uh, Thursday, the fourth of June, and it would be excellent if you would join us on uh, also this digital. Uh, exhibition uh, and you can sign up at uh, evolutionroad.se you find all the instructions so you're warmly welcome well, what does that mean do we uh, watch yes you watch us yeah. and also the minister of energy and digitalization giving his regards to electrical roads okay that's awesome yes. thank you so much it's great yeah, to have you, you so with much. us today hi um, welcome back to today's event i would like to introduce our next speaker frederick anderson global product manager for body-worn solutions at Access. Hey Allihoop. As product manager, I'm responsible for all the portfolio management, including all hardware and software for the body-worn solutions at Access. I'm of course very happy to be here today to talk about our first body-worn products. I'm also equally happy to be here to talk about representing a large and local company that has a very long, uh, deep, uh, sorry, that believes in making long-term relationships with, uh, in the company and also with customers and that, have, um, that are innovating in balance with the world around us. Axis Communications is the leader in video surveillance. The company was founded in Lund, 1984. It is now, 35 years later, a billion dollar company. It has 3,500 employees, and more than that actually, in over 50 countries around the world. Axis company culture and its core values play an integral part in all work at Axis, from R&D development to meeting the customer and actually doing a sell. The core values are also the basic principles on which we base our inv innovation work. And that means that innovation is a foundation and fundamental component of our company culture. Access innovation work has a focus on customer needs and help us secure uh, and fulfill our vision of creating a smarter and safer world. It helps to keep society safe and secure, but without infringing uh, individual privacy and with the respect to human rights. The core values are also central to AXIS sustainability ambitions. AXIS became a signatory of the UN Global Compact in 2007 and the trend principles have guided us in our ambitions um, in sustainability work since then. AXIS supports the UN 2030 agenda and actively strives to contribute to the Sustainable Developer Goals. Openness, transparency and responsibility are very important to AXIS. We believe in our existence, experience that it ensures trust and that ensures that our, all the parties that we interact with will continue to have confidence in us as a company but also in our products. We are convinced that trust and ethics will play an increasing important factor for success over time. Access products are PVC free since many years and last year we introduced our first halogen free, completely halogen free products, industry's first cameras. We have developed industry, industry leading technologies like Lightfinder and Sipstream to help the customer uh, keep uh, low, reducing their amount of energy consumption for their video surveillance systems. This year we are starting up a general project in Axis to focus on lowering energy consumption inside of our cameras. For us working with body-worn cameras, 
that has been a focus since we started out many years ago. The battery inside our camera is limited and um, we have to make sure that every feature we add has a good balance uh, against operating time. We have worked hard on that balance to ensure that we have a large enough battery and, and uh, powerful enough and also a small enough size of the actual uh, camera. Border One cameras may be a new kind of camera for Axis, but they have been around in the big world for quite some time. And I get the question every now and then, how do you plan to beat the, the components, uh, the, um, the competitors, the other players that have been around, around there for quite some time? And I've tried to summarize our plan, um, and I'm now saying that we are not focusing on introducing Axis to the Body One market. Instead, we are trying to bring the Body One market into our existing market. I'll give you three examples of that. First thing is the customer. Other players see Body One cameras as a tool mainly for the police. It helps um, to them to record from where it happens, and of course that's very much true. There's a big and there's a growing market for this already existing. And a lot of studies shows that the Body One camera provides valuable evidence, and also that it has a very positive effect on people's behavior. And it brings down the violence in the meeting between police and the public. But at, at Axis, we're thinking big. And when designed properly, we see a much wider use of this camera type. For instance, in other areas in law enforcement, uh, like government agencies and uh, prisons, we see the same kind of need. And that goes also for first responders. Body one cameras can also be used for recording training sessions for later reviewing, and we believe that's going to be very important for military and for first responders like uh, the fire departments. We're certain that the Body One cameras have a great potential uh, also beyond law enforcement. The deterrent effect that the camera has and the increased civility that is shown from the public when they know they're being filmed is going to be beneficial in so many different areas that is seen now here on the PowerPoint. All these areas already are already a part of the AXIS network. We sell video surveillance equipment to all of these target groups uh, since many years. And from a growing number of them, we have heard, you should make body one cameras. Which brings me to number two, which is the customer's needs. When we started off developing body one cameras, we didn't know anything about them, of course. But we knew that in order to have a long-term relationship with our customers, we need to do a body one camera that fits the customer's needs. Um, today, body one cameras are designed mainly as a police officer tool. But that's not good enough if you want to address all these groups. So we decided to take a research-driven design approach, and together with an external industrial design firm, we made a lot of interviews around the world uh, with customers already wearing body one cameras. We asked about the requirements they have on body one cameras. We asked about the pain points they see. We asked about details about what clothes and what uniforms they're wearing so that we could place the body one camera on them in the best of ways. We asked them what the normal work they look like and what the not so normal work they look like and what they would expect from an Axis body one camera. With some customers, we went even deeper and had them review our early industrial designs uh, for us. And with some, actually quite a lot of customers, we've done real-world field tests, um, and that has gained us a lot of information and feedback on our usability and our quality. We built the system around three components, the docking station, the system controller, and of course the body one camera itself. The docking station charges the camera when it has been out on the field for a day um, and gets the battery all charged up again. And it, eases, it makes it easy to offload video material to, um, to where it's supposed to go. The system controller is the brain and the heart of the system. That's where you go to configure and to monitor the whole system. And that's where you connect the system to the network infrastructure you have. The system controller also ensures our scalability, so we can give the same performance in a system with 4,000 cameras as we can for a system with 40 cameras. The third component, of course, being the body one camera itself, it records in full HD in 140 degrees field of view. It records audio using two microphones, and it has a pre-buffer, 
which makes it possible for us to record not only what happens after you activate the button and you take that decision to start the recording, but actually it records also footage up to 90 seconds before you even hit the button. So you can see what led up to that decision of starting a recording. The battery and the internal storage of the camera ensures that you can get 12 hours of constant recording in full HD. And if that's not enough, then you can configure the camera to actually give you up to 17 hours of constant recording. At the bottom we have put a USB-C connector that can be used to charge the camera when it's out and doing recording from a simple power bank. And it can also be used to connect an external camera sensor like the mini bullet sensor we see on the image that is perfect for mounting on a helmet. Axis is a, do professional video surveillance equipment and image quality is super important for us. That's why we are bringing wide dynamic range to the body one cameras. Wide dynamic range helps us to ensure that we get a good exposure also for those scenes where it's really dark but there are some spots that are really, really bright. We of course have included Sipstream to keep the bitstream down and save storage. And we have made sure using our image tuning capabilities that, to, that every frame we capture will be sharp and that we get good quality evidence also in a low light environment. Axis is known and well known for doing, having good build quality in our products. We offer all three years warranty on all our products and that includes also the body one cameras. The body one camera is also IP67 rated, which means that you can actually film underwater. Inside the camera, we have a few technologies that we have only begun to tap into, and they will provide a good hardware platform for us to continue to build on going forward. With all this being said, we also put a lot of effort in hiding all the techs that we have inside the camera to make it really simple to use. We have a very few amount of uh, buttons that are really big and well positioned, and we have a system, uh, sorry, status indicator that is easy to see with just a glance and understand right like that. And we've paid a lot of time into making sure that the camera is there for you to depend on whenever you need it to record something. Now, the third example, openness. And this is probably the, the real game changer for us. Most systems out there send data to a proprietary system. Axis don't believe in that, and we instead are providing, or sorry, giving the customer the ability to take control of where to store the data. A system we are, at Axis, we're always open for solutions together with our partners, and with partners, we find the best solution for our customers. That could be an Axis on premise video management system, or it could be a service based evidence management system from our partners. Our integration API makes it possible to not only send video data, but also metadata and making the partner solution just as vivid as the Axis solution. We sell through our open sales model as usual and use the benefit of our broad partner network to reach customers wherever they are. So to summarize, part of the innovation for us this time was to realize that we don't have to play by the rules in the same way that our competitors are. We use our expertise in video surveillance and we're making a body one camera solution that is a genuine Axis product. And this is how we are moving body one into our market. You can read more, of course, about the body one system in our website. And there's a lot more information about our intense work of sustainability as well on the website. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very interesting. You talk about the sustainable development goals. How can this type of body-worn technology really impact them? Well, it actually touches a couple of them, but I think uh, the one about justice is the most, the one you uh, kind of brings, okay. uh, come up to your mind the, the fastest. Um, many see body-worn cameras as a police a tool, okay. and uh, that is a, a good way of, of presenting it, I think. So, a police will get unbiased evidence, um, no one will be able to tamper on that evidence. So um, in a meeting, for instance, with public, mm -hmm. the evidence is there and is very clear and can be used in court. It contains not only video, but also audio, time, uh, the persons involved, etc. Also, you could say that the pendulum swings two ways in that if there's some pr police brutality going on, mm -hmm. that will also be caught on film. Mm -hmm. So even the public has use of the fact that the, ca the police have a camera. Okay. Yeah. You, you know that I'm from the UK and we're slightly more comfortable with security cameras. What about people in the audience that are slightly more worried about their privacy? 
Yeah, you could say that there are cameras everywhere nowadays. So what about just adding one more? Is that a big difference? Mm. It is, mm. actually. The bottom one camera is more of a personal tool than the cameras hanging on a wall. And it records audio as well. So okay. it's actually quite different. Um, we have spent a lot of time in making our system secure so that evidence management, sorry, evidence cannot be tampered with okay. in, in the system. And that plays well um, in this kind of question, actually. So imagine I'm walking onto a bus in, in Malmö, and I'm, um, we have a field test running with okay. Bina. <laughs> so I do my ticketing, and then I pick my nose. And I <laughs> went to my and, and sit in the chairs, and I... What, what stops the bus driver from actually uh, sending that, that video out on the internet? Yeah, of course. Well, he can't use the data. He cannot access the data. It's locked down in the camera. It will only leave the camera when you dock it. And then it goes right away to the management system. In the management system, there's very tight lockdown. Only a few people in the organization have access to the data, mm. perhaps only the security officer. So that helps a lot. And then data is actually removed after when it's not used for a long, long time. Another way of thinking about privacy there would be, I am the bus driver now, and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. forced to use <laughs> this tool in my everyday work. And that was not the way it was before, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm driving my bus, and I'm perhaps making a phone call in the middle of that. That will be caught on film just as much as, um, as the stuff we talked about before. And that could be a little bit troublesome. Mm -hmm. In the end, people will find um, that the camera on their chest will bring them a lot of good benefits and that's what they will focus on going forward. Thank you for answering my slightly tricky question. <laughs> Thank you for Thank coming you today. Much. Thank you. I would now like to welcome our next guests, Ulla Müllström, CMO, and Bjorn Lundqvist, CEO from Sigma Connectivity. Hi everyone, my name is Björn Lundqvist and I'm CEO of uh, Sigma Connectivity. And here by my side I have Ola Möllerström, he's a CMO or responsible of sales, I think is a clearer definition. Uh, at Sigma Connectivity we are a design house and we help our customers to innovate, design and develop smart connected products and solutions. And we were established uh, seven years ago and coming out of uh, Sony Mobile at the time we had a very profound knowledge about the mobile phone industry, of course. And our idea, and well, hope you could say at that time, was that we could take that knowledge and apply it in a different uh, industry or vertical. And it's been quite a journey. We started with 179 engineers. We are now engaging 500 engineers. We had one customer at the time. Now we have close to four. We've served uh, close to 400 customers. Uh, we have worked in many segments, automation, uh, or automotive, I should say, transportation, aviation, fashion industry also, actually, and medtech, something that Ola will talk about a little bit later. Our largest market is the US. Half of our turnover comes from the US, uh, but actually more than 70% comes from markets outside Sweden. So besides US, also Germany and uh, Denmark. We have sites in Lund here, which is our headquarter, our base, but we also have an office in Warsaw, in San Diego, San Jose, Seattle, and in Denmark, Copenhagen, since uh, my last fall, quite recently, actually. We are part of the Sigma Group, which has more than 5,000 employees and is the largest privately owned uh, consultancy group in Sweden. What I think it makes us unique is that we have a broad portfolio of competencies as well as labs in house. And uh, why is that important? Well, that brings all the resources in one place and we could do anything from a small innovation workshop to a complete product development uh, program. Competences, I think you know what it is, but what is labs? And let us show you a smart, short video to give you a glimpse of the labs.
Now you have a rough idea what I mean by labs. And now we'd like to talk a bit about what we actually do for our customers. So I hand it over here to Ola to describe something great and fun with Thank Thank you, Björn. So we have amazing engineers. We have unique labs, but I love to talk about our fantastic customers and what we develop together with our customers. One of the products that we are particularly proud about is Koala Life. Koala Life is a digital stethoscope. So you're not dependent on the individual doctor's ability to read and listen to your hearts and lungs. Now you can do it with AI and smart algorithms. Basically what you do, 30 seconds on your chest, 30 seconds measuring your EKG on your thumbs. You send the data to your phone. The phone sends it to the cloud. And through the cloud or in the cloud, we analyze the data, both the measurement you do now, but also the measurement you have done previously. And potentially also you can measure and counterpart the data from other patients. So the di diagnosis is much better, much sec more secure, and you can do it remotely, wherever you are. In short, the data sends back to the phone, into the app, and you can imagine it's like a traffic light. If you get green light, you go on your life. Yellow light, be careful. Red light, be really careful. Now it's the time to co contact your doctor, your cardiologist. And in the premium service, as all most services today have, there's a button and you call the doctor and the doctor knows all your data, all your problems, and you can immediately take it on. So this is an amazing product available in the stores as of today. Another interesting concept, let's see if I can manage this. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> I'm shaking a little bit, but this is a small, small, tiny camera. The one millimeter diameter, two millimeter long. So this is one of the smallest cameras in the world. And being a design house like us, of course you want to integrate it somewhere. You can integrate it into your glasses, you can integrate it into many stuff. And one of the areas, yeah, this is even smaller than the screws I have on my glasses. So the screws are three times bigger than this. And as a design house, you can say, why not integrate it into the screws? So then you, you don't occupy any space. This is something we have already done with a various couple of cups, customers in the world. We have integrated in glasses, we have integrated into headsets, and new form factors that are innovating the world. This particular camera, however, however is for medtech purposes. This is so small, so you can put it into your lungs. This is something we do with a great company in this region, where they are specialists in taking care of how do you put it in. And we help them optimize the camera. And here the challenge is not the same as integrating into glasses. Here it's about integrating and fine-tuning the performance of the, the, the camera, so you can manage the focal point in the very, very tiny chambers of the lungs and also, of course, the light. You don't have much light into your lungs. So th this is one of the two cases where we save the world and help the world to become better. By the way, this morning, did you see the morning news on TV4? They were talking about uh, or making an, an interview with Antisemix, another great company from Sweden. They are fighting pests, in fact, rats. In this case, it was in the city of Östersund, up in the north. They, are doing, they have made a bold statement. They are not using poison, poison any longer. They are using data and AI and smart traps to fight rats in the cities. And of course, Sigma Connectivity, we are so great and thankful to help them out developing these new kind of products and services. So Björn, our vision seven years ago that we thought that our know-how, I think we have proven right. Yeah. We are helping out in various industries with various customers, and we are looking into the future with a great, great confidence that there are more innovative things that will help and save the world because life and business depends on better connectivity. That's Thank right. you very much. Thank you. So, time for the next speaker. B by the way, Björn, have you heard about Sunfeeds? Oh, those two cool students. Yeah, I have. Two young entrepreneurs with a great idea. Please welcome Elsa and Iris. We're a 
world's greatest, most solvable health problem. Yet did you know that 820 million people are suffering from malnutrition and that that number is increasing? Isn't that one of the most provocative things you've heard? We certainly think so, and we are working to decrease that number in a sustainable and favorable way. We are Iris Bekian and Elsa Sjördahl, the founders of Sunfeeds. But first, let us introduce you to the concept of RUTF. This is a ready-to-use therapeutic food that is a sachet packed with all the essential nutrients that a starving child needs. And this concept works wonders. It enables children to be treated in their homes instead of in medical centers. And the children can easily eat the food. And they can be given in vulnerable geographic areas. So if the concept is so great, what's the problem? Well, this is what the situation looks like. There are 17 million children who are living on the edge between life and death due to hunger. And that number is increasing as well. But the possibilities to help these children are opening up due to a recently expired broad patent. This patent has caused a monopoly situation where the main franchises of RUTF production are located in Europe and in the US. And as a consequence, the only valid type of RUTF right now is a peanut-based paste. But according to UNICEF, who is the greatest purchaser of this product, there are great possibilities to make this market more sustainable. Something was developed from these problems and needs and is made to given out to uh, children who are suffering from the most severe stage of malnutrition, but can also be given out as a high energy kick. So there are two building blocks of Sunfeeds. The first one is the product. So this is a new innovative RUTF paste, which is based on sunflower kernels. This enables a new flavor, a new production and cultivation opportunity, and brings competitiveness in price as well as for our climate. But Sunfeed is more than just a product. The second building block of our company is our approach, which is also our vision. Our approach enables RUTF to go from a typical emergency response into a long-term sustainability measure. Our approach is about ensuring the economical benefits to the hunger-affected regions. And this we do by locating the production of the Sunfeeds product close to the hunger problem, as well as basing our business upon the global goals. So today we are product developing together with a food lab and are planning to launch three pilot projects this autumn. One here in Sweden and two in Africa. And many thanks goes out to the people who have helped us along the way towards achieving our first goal, which is helping our first child by the end of 2020. It only takes three of these for six to eight weeks for a child to go from a severely acute malnourished stage to a more stable stage and be on her way to a healthier life together with her society. It isn't more complicated than that. We have enough resources in the world to end hunger. We just need to take action. By venturing on Sunfeeds, you're venturing on a world without hunger. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're great, Elsa and Iris, and you have a very great idea. You both live in Sweden. Has it been easy to establish your company? So yeah, we, we think it's uh, complicated so at some times to work with uh, production in another country, but we think that this product has two things to it, two opportunities and two benefits. One of them being that it's a great short-term aid product that really can bring people up from the most severe stage of malnutrition, but also another benefits that come from the production, which is both economical and social benefits. And of course, by placing this near affected regions, we can bring those benefits to the, these areas as well, turning it not only a short-term sustainability measure, but also a long-term aid and sustainability measure. Thank you. Well, so, being this is important that you are successful, so what, what, what's your next step? Well, right now we are finishing up the product development stage and the only part we have left is the packaging. So we are looking for a flow pack machine and a place to package. And when that's done, we are ready to start our small scale production here in Sweden. And for that, we are looking for customers who are interested in a product that is very high in energy and doesn't have any nuts in it to try out. And that could be in hospital environments, for an example. Good luck. Thank, Thank you very you. much. <laughs> Thank you. Now I think it's time for our next speaker.
Hello everyone, I'm just going to get uh, the remote if that's okay, no problem. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Sarandis Kaloyeropoulos and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, digital identity in a physical world. But uh, first of all, I would like to explain where we are right now. Uh, we are in Lund. Lund, for many people, maybe is a small town, but there's a lot of things that has happened in this town. There's a lot of innovative companies. I started working for Ericsson in 1998, and there's a lot of innovation coming from this town. A lot of students had ideas, what should we do and that, and today we see companies like the ones you heard before, Sigma Connectivity, we have Sony, we have Ericsson, Tetra Pak, we have, uh, uh, yeah, maybe I've forgotten something. And then we have Precise Biometrics. It started in 1997 with Biometric Solutions, and this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, as you all know, uh, everything is getting connected. When I was started in Ericsson, I remember we had a cake when we sold 7 million units. That was big volumes back then. Now we have like 5.2 billion people that actually are connected to internet. This is what we have today. That means that this will go on for further in new verticals, like cars, like, for example, real estate. And as you can see, there, there are not so many connections there are as in the mobile industry, but it will come. Now, this will give us a chance how we can maybe change this to become more sustainable. Today, you all know, you have keys, you have a lot of things telling you who you are. You would like to go and enter a bank, or you would like to access a real estate, or you would like to go to the gym. You always need to bring up your plastic cards. That's what I usually say. Just look at what I have with me today. I think I own about uh, yeah six to eight plastic cards telling me who I am. So when I go to Circle K to put some gas, I need to have that card. If I go to my job, I need to have that card. And this is what we believe that needs to change. Uh, I, I read yesterday, actually, before I came here, that around six cards per owner, there is about 10 billion cards that will be produced next year, plastic, to tell who you are to enter something, that's like 52,000 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And this is because this is what we have had. So we, we really challenge this. We want to help that how can we turn this around? And I know that some people will say, oh, this is science fiction. But this is already happening, that you could use your biometric solutions to actually various things. For example, you could pay. We have seen this coming in Asia quite much. You could actually access a place where you actually can look at the camera and the camera will say, yeah, you're the right person. Please come in. You could actually uh, turn your car on. Things like this will happen. And this is our chance to help to become a more sustainable world, to remove a lot of these things that we actually wear today that tells you and us who we are. So that was my very quick presentation about what Precise Biometrics is doing to help the world to maybe become more plastic free. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really want to kind of find out more about how this type of technology could help us achieve the sustainable development goals. Yes, I mean, <laughs> if you think about it, it started by that for example, we humans, we are very in a secure level saying that we need to trust each other. Mm -hmm. And the only way of trusting each other is that we actually give each other an object. Yeah. It started actually from many years ago when people had tattoos. You could see who I am mm -hmm. by wearing a special tattoo. Then you know, oh, it is a Randis. And this moved over. We need to have passports, keys, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We think with the technology today, we can turn this around, which means people do not need to wear too much unnecessary objects produced in a very strange way to tell you who I am. I have everything I need. That is what we think we can solve a big issue in the future. 
Uh, that, that, that's amazing. I've never even kind of thought about that type of options. But um, what about, okay, I take your picture, I put it up. Am I able to trick this type of technology? Can I become you? You can <laughs> become me, of course. You take a picture of me and you would like to <laughs> enter. And that's why we're okay. working with liveness algorithm that actually will put the safety very important rules that, okay, that is a person, but is it really a live person yeah. or is it okay. a picture? So we are working on it so we can become a de facto stand on how to access a place. And this type of technology, we hear about it more and more, but what might makes you guys so interesting and different? I mean, biometrics, precise biometrics, started in 1997 mm. by a visionary guy. Okay. His name was uh, Ferreo. Some of you maybe know that. And uh, his idea was that actually one day we could identify with who you are. So you can imagine 23 years of research and development within c this area. We have become quite strong. So we are already existing in a lot of mobile phones when you actually would like to turn the phone with your fingerprint. So okay. for us, we're a small company, agile. Yeah. We trust in doing things several times, error, doesn't matter. But this is the somehow advantage we have with bigger companies that needs to have a lot of decision making. We don't need to do that. You just run, yeah. hit, and then we'll see if we can make it. I want to hear what does your vision of the future look like? Inspire us. Okay. You've got the audience here. <laughs> I, I was once asked that and then I had another answer. Now when I go, <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, I think that uh, my vision is that uh, what happens now is that we always think about what is most sustainable. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, I, and because of the circumstances we have today, I think this will keep us in mind that sustainability is very important. So my vision is that from day one, when you design a product, the environmental friend in mind will be part of you directly. Yeah. Not like, for example, for many years, you produce a product and then three minutes before the goal, then you start asking, how will we do this halogen free? Oh, maybe we should change. That shouldn't be part. So my vision is that everything that has to do with saving the world or uh, the universe or whatever should be part of when you start thinking, design or developing something. That's uh, my vision, at least. I think that's really interesting. And I think some of the, the younger business entrepreneurs we saw today really evidence exactly. that, right? Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, Really nice to have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we go from the, the future to the past. Our next speaker is going to take you back to the Viking era with the Danish king, Harold Bluetooth. I would like to introduce our next speaker, Sven Mattesen, senior expert at Ericsson Research Ericsson. Thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I started at Ericsson in 95 with a background from university as a professor. So what do you do with a professor in industry? Is he to be trusted? Well, you, you put them at some project or activity that's not core business. So this is what I ended up working with. Together with my colleague, Jav Halsen, we were assigned the task to develop a wireless cable for mobile phones. The idea was to replace the cable from the phone to headset, the cable between devices that uh, locally wanted to communicate. So the paradigm was like 10 meters, shouldn't add any power consumption, shouldn't add any size, um, and of course uh, cost was uh, key. So that concept was easy, but how did we do it? Well, key thing, traditionally short range radios in those days consisted of several chips of different, sometimes exotic technologies, bulky filters, uh, a lot of stuff. So we needed to get rid of those uh, components and target standard CMOS uh, chip design, like we see in today's digital uh, technologies. 
So one thing was to get rid of filters. Uh, one idea was to try and find a global frequency we could use, a frequency band. Um, and the ISM band at 2.4 gigahertz turned out to be handy. Eventually, uh, we realized that there are some holes in that in s some countries, so we actually needed to negotiate with the French military for them to lift their restrictions, and, and lo and behold, they yielded eventually. So, frequency band was fixed, but we wanted to get rid of filters fil taking away interference, and, and one technique that was actually invented in '42 by Austrian-American film actress Hedy Lamar was frequency hopping. If you envision two piano players, they they play, but they have they don't have the same tune. It's just a gobble of notes. But if they play the same tune and in sync, they will press the same keys on the pianos and you will hear you uh, a nice tune. And this was the idea with frequency hopping. The radios constantly retune to a new frequency. And in our design, we hopped 1,600 times uh, a second, very fast. Uh, that way we could sort of smear out interference by not visiting that frequency very often. So then we got rid of, could make all the filters on chip. So we had a solution that uh, you can see on the slide, which is almost uh, just uh, a block diagram, but it's actually a circuit diagram. Now, if, if we have a concept, uh, we need to take it to the market, and we quickly re realized that Ericsson could not make everything. Uh, we, had the, we had the phone and maybe the headset, but all, all other pieces of equipment. So we tried to team up with industry, and um, that was not working too well until uh, Intel laptop division saw the light in Santa Clara. Normal uh, desktop business, they didn't see the point in a wireless cable, but the laptop business did. So we teamed up and uh, thought, how, how, should we, how should we market this? And we ended up uh, for proposing uh, or deciding to uh, start a special interest group with the founding members, of course, Ericsson and Intel, but also Nokia, Toshiba and IBM, major players in industry in those days, and, uh, and still, uh, make this standard, promote it and make it freely available. The only really price you had to pay for use it was to not block others from using it. So if you have IPR, you, you could not uh, hold them or, or sue anyone for infringement to uh, implement the standard. Products, that's a different story. And this group they is growing day by day. Um, so there are thousands of company part now. The first products occurred uh, by Ericsson uh, around 2000. I've listed four of them from an old slide here. The bottom line, uh, bottom one, which looks like an iPad, actually never became a product, but the other were products. Um, as with all technical things that you propose or, or design, there is a slight delay in, in actually getting products out. And uh, that caused a lot of hype blaming. We were blamed for hyping Bluetooth, and uh, people thought, predicted it would die. Uh, but uh, well, with our products in around 2000 and a few years later, actually quite a few, it took off. And it took off in exponential fashion. So um, um, we were very happy. And I think uh, the reason for this was there was a very low threshold for startups to use it. Uh, they have no investments in IPR. They have lots of ideas. And this was free to use. Bigger companies may be concerned giving up their IPRs, but uh, they have the market potential. So it's critical to quickly get get the footprint on the market. We actually proposed uh, our technology, our concept, before we launched it to a Home RF Consortium, and they turned it down. Uh, but uh, that was an interesting event anyway, because it caused Jim Kardak of Intel and me to visit the bar and talk about Harold Bluetooth, and, and uh, actually the name came that way. Uh, Having succeeded eventually, you can look back and think, 
what actually made this happen? And I think, uh, of course, the key thing is this is something people want and understand they want. And that's also why there was a hype blame, because people wanted it not two years from now, they wanted it now. Uh, we had a good specification. We actually tailored it for cost and for a very clear use case. Uh, the wireless cable, it's not too long. It is not consuming power. It can't be costly, uh, and etc. <coughs> And, and uh, normally in the business we were trying, we were doing more sub-optimization and, and trying to do as, good, as best as we could for e each part. But here we try to focus on, on, on the complete sort of experience. We co-designed both the hardware and the software. We were not pushing problems around. We tried to solve them the best way we could. And, and as an example is the frequency hopping we used. That way we could take away filters that were considered necessary otherwise. And we also had a very clear picture that this needs to be fabricated in large volumes. So uh, <coughs> single chip integration in, in CMOS technology was a must. In fact, there was a po point in the project we were discussing how signals should look like. We realized that the address field of, of the packet we are transmitting was too short. So we had to decide, okay, are we energy efficient today or will we be out of business tomorrow because of too few addresses? So we extended the field and said, oh, if we're not successful, who cares? If we're successful, it's needed. So uh, that kind of thinking, um, it's very hard when you're a developer to, to consider success. Not to forget also that this was mainly done in Lund, of course, with uh, Ericsson, a com big company with lots of skilled people everywhere. But together with the university here in Lund, we had more or less all competence needed locally, which made it very simple, convenient to do the development. We just met people next door, basically, to discuss. And should there be a very tough question? Well, we could. We had our networks to to rely on. So there is still a, an evolution, of course, in Bluetooth. So, what's next? Well, we uh, decided. We we were very focused initially on on sort of the headset-like application. We realized that there are other applications we will not optimize for. And the standards have evolved with faster mode, uh, even lower power mode. And I think most uh, Bluetooth units that you use or see today are BLE, or the next version of BLE, which is Bluetooth 5.0, which has extended the range, but also speed. So it's, it's widening the circles a bit and mesh networking. Mesh networking has been around for quite some time, but never really taken off. But it's very interesting concept in that you are using your neighbor's radio resource to extend your range, of course, with their consent. And that is a technology that's built into to Bluetooth. So the classic one was more for headset. Uh, low energy, obviously, to uh, reduce the power consumption and to make the, the footprint, the energy footprint, very small. We have uh, beacons. You can you many stores use the iBeacon technology, which is based on Bluetooth. So you can send uh, relevant messages to people, either uh, commercials or, or information, like in museums. What am I looking at? We have uh, the mesh I've mentioned, and this has expanded the, the use of Bluetooth from music and keyboards to uh, medical and uh, many other applications. And volumes are staggering. Two, two years from now, it's estimated that there will be produced 5.2 billion units that year. Actually not produced, sold or shipped. And total 40 billion shipped. So with that, I thank you.
Thank you very much. I mean, that's a very impressive history that you've told us. I would like to know, you talked about what made it possible, but what made it so successful? I think, um, first of all, it was something people wanted mm -hmm. uh, and could understand, as I said, that they wanted. Uh, but also the backing. We, uh, with the founding members of the SIG, Nokia and Ericsson implemented it uh, in the handsets, mm -hmm. in their handsets. Um, James Bond flashed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually many people had Bluetooth before they realized it because it was already available in the handsets. With Toshiba and IBM, large laptop manufacturers in those days, they also put it in. So you sort of building an infrastructure, although that's not necessarily needed because Bluetooth is a point-to-point -point link. Okay, so think about the theme of today. Yep. How do we link this type of technology to the SDGs and how can it, how can it make us achieve the SDGs? Yeah, it's, it's a bit like a road. Yeah. <laughs> it's an infrastructure, but um, since we are replacing cables, cables contain copper, uh, cables conne contain connectors that will not fit. We all have experienced that you want to connect to something and, ooh, I have the wrong type mm -hmm. of connector. Bluetooth solves that by, by using either mm -hmm. for, for communication and it's a universal connector. I mentioned medical applications. Mm -hmm. It's helping out uh, in behind the scenes with many, many um, uh, uses. And uh, sensor networks, you can have uh, sensors, collect data, and when you pass by, you can collect it. So there are very many um, not so visible means yeah. that Bluetooth uh, adds. And they, I think it's sometimes it lower power than a cable as well. Mm -hmm. So you've told us a lot about kind of the journey. I'm really interested to pick, pick your brain. What, what do you see the vision for the future? What's, what's, what's possible? <laughs> I think further miniaturization is of course okay. uh, still possible. Uh, I think uh, we are moving up in frequency. So uh, in fact, uh, the r why we thought we could pull this off uh, almost 25 years ago mm -hmm. was you can see how technology develops in exponential fashion. And if you look at radio connections over time per unit area, there has been exponential growth since Marconi for more well over 100 years. And I, I think we will, of course, see a continue that trend continue. So we will get more, more convenience, more uh, connections. And like uh, previous speakers have been mm -hmm. talking about uh, part of uh, your identity, it will be convenient to use. The network will figure out you are allowed to do this. You don't have to mess around and look in manuals. How should I hook this up? That's exciting. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today. It was absolutely my pleasure to listen to you. Thank you. And I have, uh, must say I'm very pleased to have had a very interesting journey myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I've been lucky. Thanks. Thank you so much. So this has been a really interesting, diverse range of speakers. But I hear you ask, what's next? I would like to introduce the next speaker, Sarah Edman, Manager, UN Ops Global Innovation Center, Sweden, to the stage. Hi, what an inspiring day. Really, really interesting. I want us all now, when we've learned about all these very inspiring innovations, some of them that have already made an impact in the world and some that most likely will. Now, I would like us to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. This one, our planet. This is our home. This is Mother Earth. How is she doing today, you think? Well, if I should speak for her, I guess I, it's safe to say that things have been better. Maybe she's worried. 
exhausted. And I think you all agree with me that we have to take care of her. We have to. I also think that the whole COVID pandemic that we're in has taught us that we are all vulnerable and that change can happen quite suddenly that can have such a huge impact on many aspects of our lives. This pandemic is just an example, but I think we should really consider it our wake-up call to take action. We have built systems in our world that sometimes hinder us, and it's time to find new ways of doing things. And I hope that this tragic pandemic also serves as an opportunity for us to do these big changes. I really hope we will take that chance. So we need to take care of our planet. What is it then that we should do? Well, I think you know this by now. These are the 17 sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030, meaning that these are the big, bold, ambition goals that the world's countries have agreed to meet by 2030, meaning that there's not a lot of time left because we have big things to do. And 17 goals, if we want to just summarize it, you can say that we're aiming to end poverty, to fight inequalities, and to stop climate change. There you have the essence. And it can seem overwhelming, of course, complex. But I assure you that if you go in and read about these different goals, and you take a look at the underlying targets connected to every goal, I'm sure that you will find that it's all very relevant. I'm sure that you will also see immediately that there is quite a lot of things that you can do already now to help moving this in the right direction. And also, as we heard this morning, they are linked. So actually, if we make an impact that has an effect on one of them, it's likely that several others will be impacted as well. And we should use that in a smart way. So actually, this whole framework serves as an insightful guide to probably humanity's biggest opportunity to create a world that we can all be proud of, both us today and future generations. So I can also say, linked to the COVID pandemic, that actually if we would have come further with those targets by now, we would have been a bit better prepared when this hit us. So let's make sure that we are better prepared for coming challenges that come our way. So no one can fix this alone, of course. It's a big, big task. So how can we do this? Who should do this? Well, I mean, it's not you or me or United Nations, for that matter, that can do it all on their own. But what if, what if we all pitch in what we have? what we can, and we all take our responsibility to do this together. I think that's our only hope, actually. And it's quite interesting because we have such a big chance to make an impact in our roles as just human beings on this planet, as employees, as leaders, and as consumers. We can impact much more than maybe we think. And we should use that power to make that impact on our immediate surroundings. This all drops of hope will make a big sea of impact, I'm sure. But will that be enough then if we all go out, we learn about this and we tweak our lives in the right direction? Sadly, no, it will not. There is more work to be done here. Because in addition to those changes, we also need to take game-changing leaps. And this is actually the reason why the United Nations and UN Ops has decided to start working with innovation. Because we know that there is much more to be done here. 
And we believe in innovation height. We believe in really pushing for innovation that makes a big and dramatic drift different to what we're having today. Not just tweaking existing solutions and so on, but taking those big, bold steps. That's what we need. And that is what we are going to focus on. We have to take bold risk when we do it. And we have to work with time horizons that are quite long, even though we need to push them to be as short as it possibly can. So in order to do this, we need the best ideas. And where can we find them then? Well, I guess we can find them almost anywhere. I'm sure that we will find quite a lot, quite a lot of interesting ideas just in ecosystems as the ones we are learning about today. Here in Skåne, in Sweden, etc. There is a lot popping up that is quite, quite relevant here. But I'm also sure that we will be able to find interesting ideas among people out in the world that are living close to the problems. And just looking at people that are facing the effects of climate change on a daily basis, they know the problem quite well. They have a huge sense of urgency, of course, because it's about their lives. So I'm sure that they also have quite a lot of good ideas about what can be done differently. And we need to come together to work on that. So in this whole picture, it's important with diversity. That's something we believe in. And that's also why I'm quite happy to see the line of speakers today, where we have different types of people, different types of companies and generations. And when we all come together with our different backgrounds and perspectives, that is when I think we can come to the most interesting and impactful solutions. So when we find these ideas, the maturity of them and where they come from, that doesn't really matter. Because if we find them, we will find a way to work with it. And how will we find them then? Well, most of them will hopefully be found through our global innovation challenges that we are co-creating with our global partners from the private sector, where Sony is the first example. And when we find these great ideas, we are going to support them together with our partners to make sure to bring them to a global market. And when doing that, we need to work with incubation, we will do pilots on the field where things are really happening, making sure that we can get this out and become sustainable for real. Another interesting tool that we have in our hands now is the fact that you and ops can now invest in impactful ideas. And this is something new. United Nations has not done that kind of things before. And it's a tool that we will use wisely. So what we are doing now is that we are establishing a global ecosystem of innovation centers. 15 to 20 centers that we will open around the world. And the purpose of this is to help facilitate the movement of all these ideas coming together to solve the big challenges of the world. And we want to act as a catalyst here and bring everyone together. And we have to do this in a very cost efficient way because actually we are not funded by the UN as such. So the key here is collaboration. Back to what I said earlier, that we all take responsibility to put in whatever resources we have. So if we're a company, big or small, we can pitch in resources, people, labs, etc., that can help make this work. So I want to sh share some perspectives that we aim to put together here. And the first one, maybe obvious, is the needs with solutions. So what the world really needs based on the great experiences that we have of United Nations work around the world, and also with these brilliant ideas that we're looking to find from around the world. Of course, we need to have everything anchored in the best possible research, etc. Then we have another perspective, and that is the global one. 
that we will involve interesting countries here and an interesting mix of countries. And we believe that we will have most of our centers in less developed countries. So then countries like Sweden and Japan, where we're operating now, that have a more mature innovation ecosystem. So from Sweden's perspective, we can tap into our ecosystem. We can, of course, help strengthen it together. And we can then also give something to the other countries of the world who has not come as far. So if we look at the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we're most likely open next, they will not have an idea in science park to start their first office in. So then we need to compensate for that and to create something similar there. And that is what we intend to do. So it's quite a big and exciting project. And an interesting component here are the governments. Because we believe that we have to work close to the governments so that we are letting them share the ownership of this with us. And also help to open doors to new markets for these ideas that we're working with. Then we have another one the private and the public sector, with a lot of important components. We will find investors, we will find science parks such as Ideon, we will find then educators and other players that are so important to include here. And this is also quite special from a United Nations perspective to make partnerships with the private sector. That is a tool that has not existed before and I'm really excited about what this can bring us. Last but not least, we have the individuals versus organizations, because we believe in the power of passionate individuals. And maybe you are working for a, an organization today that doesn't yet take these things seriously, but you know in your heart that we have to, then we want to team up with you, because we can support you to drive that change where you are and then we can get everyone on board. So what we're doing now is that we are creating and building communities around all these centers. And in our communities, the members will get access to a global toolbox of education, incubation, investments, and policy support. And I'm sure this will be a quite exciting thing for all of us. And we are defining this right now because actually right now we are a startup ourselves. We opened our center here half a year ago. So we are building all the processes and the framework and we are now fine tuning on the concept of what the local community should look like. And as soon as we're ready to launch, we will make calls for action. And then I invite all of you to join us I really hope you want to do this together with us. So, to summarize, we need to take care of our world. We must do that. We have a big task ahead of us. We know what needs to be done. And we can do it if we team up. And if we are creative here, so I really want to link back to what Mia said this morning. She said that, who knows, maybe you will bring in the next big idea that will help saving the world. And that's exactly what we should think here. So I want to encourage you to now get inspired. Make sure that you, I'm sure you got a lot of inspiration today from these different speakers but also find inspiration in the SDG framework. Look at the targets, look a bit closer to what needs to be done out there. And then also get inspired by whatever inspires you as an individual. And to add to that, I want to challenge you to start doing new things. Because actually as simple as that, newness inspires newness. And when we change habits and things in our day-to-day -day life, things happen and new ideas pop up. It can be very simple things, such as taking another route to wherever you're going or trying some new types of food or whatever, but don't underestimate that because that is what may give you the inspiration to that brilliant idea. 
And when you have that idea, or maybe you already do, maybe you're already working on something that you think would be a good fit to our program, then we hope to hear from you. And we hope that you would want to apply to the global innovation challenges that we are running. We actually have one open now in Japan. So if you are applying to that one and you see here the, our web page address where you will find the information, then if you're selected, you will be invited to a boot camp in Japan. And if we then select you in the final round, we will offer you a space in one of the centers around the world, linked to whatever theme you are working on. Because actually here in Sweden, for instance, we have the honor to take lead on the areas of deep technology and gender mainstreaming, two very important areas for the world. And in the same theme, the other centers will also have their areas. And that will always be linked to what the host country think is important, as well as what kind of knowledge is available locally. So we can do this together. And I can also say that we will open up in this local community for pitching sessions. So that will be another way in uh, when we have launched it. So with that, I just want to summarize to say that let's all come together to save the world one challenge at a time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's great to be here with you on the stage I know. today. I know, Rebecca. <laughs> this is my dear colleague, of course, and we have the pleasure of working together day to day. So it's, uh, it's an honor to be here together. Absolutely. And you've said lots of interesting things, but if we take a step back mm -hmm. and we start with sustainable development goals, how can people really engage with them? Well, first of all, I think start to read about it and, and really look at the material. There is quite a lot of good material available, actually. And I brought one example today. Okay. This is a very simple one. <laughs> Something like this, where all the goals are listed and also the underlying targets there are 169 of them with very concrete examples. And something like this can be quite useful to just have in your office and just use whenever you're meeting with clients or having team meetings and just look at things and see whatever inspires you. And also to discuss this, talk about it, both at work and, and with your colleagues mm -hmm. and friends and family, because you will find different perspectives. I can also recommend an app okay. called STGs in Action. And uh, that is a, a quite a good app, actually, where you both can learn about the STGs. You can find interesting facts and videos and so on. And you can also take action there. Okay. So you can challenge other people and you can team up with people from all around the world that are striving to do the same. So that can be an interesting route as well. Then, of course, when we launch our community, <laughs> we are also going to have activities that will help everyone to engage in this together. Because, of course, we have access to quite powerful SDG expertise in the UN that we want to make available for the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you managed, you m mentioned the Japanese challenge that's open at the moment. Yes. But you also mentioned another challenge. Yes. <laughs> when we started here half a year ago, we had a first challenge launched. And uh, that challenge has had, uh, it was by the way of the topic of advancing resilient infrastructure in the face of climate change. So quite a broad topic, which was intentionally because we wanted to scan what's out there. What is it that we can start working with now? Then as we go, we will most likely have more and more targeted uh, areas as well. But uh, we got a really interesting range of applications from all over the world, actually 72 countries. That, that was quite impressive, and I, I remember sitting and scrolling through that list of countries, and it was powerful. So we have worked on the selection here, together with the jury, which has been then the Day on Science Park and Sony. And we have selected now the top 26 mm -hmm. ideas to take forward. And actually, plan A, before the COVID pandemic, was to run a physical boot camp yep. in Lund, uh, now here in the early summer. Now we have created a plan B. So instead, we are then working with a virtual session for the top 26 candidates that we will kick off here in June. 
And then as soon as the situation allows, we will then have a selection, about 15-ish teams that will be invited to a boot camp here, and then we'll take it from there. So uh, it's quite exciting, but we have to be flexible, we have to be innovative, so now we're doing something different to make sure that we can still create value in this period. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you mentioned that this was the second of numerous innovation centers yes. springing up around the world. Why, why did they choose Lund? That's an interesting question. And I mean, I think what we have learned about here today answers that to, to quite a big part because they needed somewhere where quite a lot of work had been done, where there is a good experience and a good maturity mm -hmm. of the local innovation ecosystem. Then, of course, it's also due to passionate individuals. Back to that theme. We have Mia here from Midea on Science Park, who's been instrumental. We also have people from Sony who were pushing this really well and some other key players. And that has made also a big difference. And then we have the closeness to the UNOPS headquarters, which is actually in Copenhagen. Okay. So that link is there as well. But uh, now we, I can mention also that we have one center at Antigua and Barbuda in the Caribbean. And uh, we're opening in Japan, as I mentioned. And then we have an interesting list of countries mm -hmm. here in the pipeline. So uh, you will be able to learn more about that as we go. So lots of exciting things happening. Yes. So yes. how can people find out more, how can they get in engaged, what's the next step for them? Well, I would say stay tuned. You can go in and take a look at our website already now if you want to apply to the challenge that we are open. Uh, then, of course, we have actually just launched a Facebook page, which is a first step to a social media <laughs> campaign. And there you will be able to follow our work in our centers and learn more about what we do. And I think more is to come in that direction. And then as soon as we have the everything ready for the local community, we are going to make a, a good launch. And then we will do our best to reach all of you with that information. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Today, we have heard from a diverse range of innovators, organizations, and people. And they're putting in a lot of great effort to help us achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals give us a mandate for change. And we have, clearly, the tools, the expertise, and the passion. We need to work together to achieve this mission. I would like to thank all the speakers today, our sponsors, our organizers, Edeon Science Park, Mobile Heights, and Innovation Scorner. And most importantly, I want to thank you, each and every single one of you that has tuned in today throughout the session. We have to do this together. We have a mission, all of us. Thank you so much. <laughs>